Yeah, warm welcome, warm afternoon. Uh, nice to have you here in the Hau Hebbler Mufa. Nice to have you here at Berlinale Talents. It's a big pleasure uh, to see the house packed again. Um, and as you know, so at least if you've been already with us, um, Berlinale Talents is an initiative that brings together people from 12 different fields of work, not only film directors or producers, but we have also the privilege not only to watch films, uh, we have the privilege to speak about films and listen to films. And uh, today, I think, is a special occasion. So because we have uh, people here who are pro, uh, exper experts, especially when it comes up to sound. Um, and also, of course, we have the privilege to see it actually happening here. Um, this is new, rather new at Berlinale Talents, that we not only speak about it, but also do live workshops in this format. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and I will leave the floor for about an hour or so uh, to these two gentlemen here on the left or on the right from your side. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to just briefly introduce them. And I do it once um, as a couple in a way, not a couple in, literally, but it's uh, some people who just also collaborate on many, many, many films together. And this is also interesting for us, of course, uh, to see how actually is a cooperation taking place in between two different fields of work which have a lot in common and a lot in common to do when it comes up to film and sound. Uh, but let me nevertheless uh, introduce them separately for just one second. Um, and I start with Peter Albrechtsen. He's on the right side, also from your side. Peter, thank you very much for coming. Peter is an uh, award-winning Danish sound designer, a mixer, a music supervisor, both on feature uh, fiction films and also on documentaries, which is a topic I think we will tackle today as well. Um, it includes quite a number of films, and some of them has been here also at the Berlinale, for example, Generation Wealth, you might remember it from last year, um, and Panorama, a wonderful film, The Distant Barking of Dogs, recently nominated also for the European Film Awards, uh, I think a film that is uh, here also tackled today and discussed Blind Spot, Thelma, the wonderful one, and also you did sound effects recordings for Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk. Very interesting. Um, and uh, then there's a film which is fond to myself, and it's once again a film that you worked on together, which is uh, The Happiest Day in the Life of Oli Mekki. I think that's a wonderful film. If you haven't seen it or listened to it, do it. Um, it's really great, and this is a film also you worked and collaborated together. So, which brings me to Heike Kossi on the left side. Heike, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, thank you. Heike has been a Foley artist and also music uh, and sound supervisor for over 300 films. So I think you're one of the ones with a very, very long IMDb page. <laughs> so you have to yeah. scroll a lot if you are on Heike's IMDb page um, because you started working already in 2001. Your studio is located in Kokkola in Finland. So quite a long journey. Um, thank you very much for coming and bringing all the stuff with you, of course. Um, but you've also been working on many films we know, including The Little Prince, which won the best animation film in 2016. Uh, a film that is fond to me personally, Barbarian Sound Studio, Peter Strickland's film, um, and then also, of course, films that we've already mentioned, so I could go on with 300 films, um, <laughs> but uh, The Distant uh, Barking of Dogs, uh, or Chris the Swiss, which was in Cannes. Without any further ado, I leave the space uh, to you. Uh, we will come back to a Q&A towards the last third of the session, uh, but before that, the floor is yours. I listen carefully. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, usually we say that sound is the most invisible part of the film. And um, it's a little uh, nerve-wracking to have all you people here and suddenly it's quite visible. It's not supposed to be that way. We kind of hide in the dark and make all our secret moves. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to start out just telling the story of how uh, the two of us met. Um, it was back in 2012. I was working on a um, Finnish documentary called Canned Dreams, which also screened here at Berlin, I think. Um, and um, it was a very complex film with lots of amazing images that needed a lot of foley. And uh, it, that was never put into the budget in, 
the early stages. So I said to the Finnish producer that we really need some Foley for this film. And then he said, no worries, I've got a friend who can do Foley. And I was like, <laughs> a friend that can do Foley? Okay, let's try that. And then I went through the film and made long, long, long lists of every, every detail that I wanted to have Foley for. And I thought, okay, now this guy on the other end, he's gonna get a nervous attack and I will then be able to hire the guy that I would like to work with. And then I sent off these lists and then a few days passed by and I got back the most amazing Foley I had ever heard for every, every little detail. And that's when I realized that this was Heike Koshi and I needed to work with this guy. So nowadays I tell my producers that um, I'm not doing a film without Heike. Um, and that's actually true. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it was definitely the first time we worked together and not the last one, but uh, in the very beginning, we, I, just, I think we both noticed that our aesthetics were on the same level. And uh, you, were talking, you, were all, you were always talking about the texture of each sound. It needs to be something else than just the feet or step or, or whatever. And, uh, and uh, it's been a, many years with amazing projects and uh, more to come. Uh, actually, I need to say here, how many knows what is Foley? Okay, who doesn't know? Ask from the next, next one who is sitting there. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's, it's a, just quickly, it's a technique where you do Foley as a looking picture, same time. It's an organic way of doing sound. So uh, uh, somebody's walking on the, on the screen, I'm watching at my studio same person, I'm trying to do the sound with, with, with that person. I, there's people who think that it's a technical thing, but I think it's it's really big part of the sound design process and, um, um, you know, it's, it's more like sound acting. I'm acting with the characters, I'm acting with the things which are moving on a, on a, on a screen and uh, I'm acting with the feeling of the screen. So, uh, yeah. What we, we brought today some different clips and examples and um, um, for a few of these clips Heike will show some of his tricks. Um, so um, we started out by, uh, this is uh, the first clip we want to show is um, from a, a Danish science fiction movie that we worked on two years ago which is called Keda, uh, directed by Max Kestner. Um, it's, um, it's a quite special film in many ways. I mean, most of it takes place in like a future Copenhagen lying underwater, but it's also about a main character who splits up himself and sends half of himself to the past, to our present. And then uh, the other half in the future realizes that he has to go back and get him back to the future. Mm. Uh, so if anyone of you understands the plot by now, then I give you an award. Um, but at least what this means is that this scene I'm going to show, or we're going to show, is a scene where this guy meets himself in a park and, um, yeah, special things happen. But I want to show the film first with just the dialogue. Um, so we hear the f the, this clip with the, just the dialogue. So it's a, it's a, um, well now like we, they, they're gonna chase each other around in this uh, sequence and just wanted to kind of show that, that how empty this is. This is just, you're hearing the dialogue but really not much else. Mm. So we want to should start layering up sounds to create the physicality of the characters. Um, and uh, this is where you take over, Heike. Yeah, actually, this is the moment where I, 
start when the picture is edited and uh, we have uh, this kind of clean dialogue track and uh, then we just need to start working. And uh, I'm just showing just basic things that uh, we start with the uh, feet and uh, Normally, well, I need to say that this is not the Foley studio. This Foley studio is it, it's the place where it's a different kind of acoustics and, uh, and uh, I have a pits for walking on different surfaces. So this is, I didn't bring this stone from Finland, it's from here. So, <laughs> so um, this is German idea of good concrete pit. <laughs> no, just kidding. Okay, but uh, should we start from here? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. now they're working, walking on a, on a, on a, when cobblestone, this can, can be a good one. And uh, if I'm just doing it with, uh, just a second, with, uh, like this, can you just play it, play back yeah, a little yeah. bit? Okay, now they go to grass. So it sounds pretty, uh, you can just put back to the same place. So it sounds a little bit uh, clean, like an indoor, is it? So I take a little bit of coffee. And uh, try it with that one. And uh, normally I do so that I do all the concrete feet first, but now I notice that they are going to grass. Oh boy. And uh, so I have some grass here and Okay, let's try. I do the first guy. I try to do the first guy. Let's say that they came back to concrete. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and um, actually, I'm really happy that you clap your hands. But uh, somebody said that uh, everybody can walk in sync. Everybody can walk in sync. If you just follow someone on the street, you can start following in sync with him or her. And uh, that's actually why I how I started. I went to coffee place sit down and I'm watching people on the street and or when I'm walking on the street I pick up someone and start walking with his or her rhythm. <laughs> very, very cheap, very cheap uh, 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 training. But uh, uh, actually with this film it was also interesting because one of the persons was from future, another one was from, from nowadays. And Peter had a really nice idea that um, the people in future they are kind of conscious about sound. So I, I did the people on nowadays like clacky, but then I used like free run shoes for the people from future who sounds more like a... And it's a little difference, but the, sometimes little things make the difference, yeah. But uh, then, we, uh, first I do all the feet for those people, then I move the clothes. And uh, should we just continue from yeah, here? Yeah. I just raised up the microphone a little bit. So, uh, they are having a little bit this kind of clothes. Oh, but it's, this is dusty. <laughs> So I try to again act and move like they are moving. And uh, let's see. Might be looking funny, but not feeling funny. <laughs> okay.
and so on. We go through the whole movie, just, I hope you related my sound with the movement. And uh, that's how we do glow track for the whole movie. If somebody's having leather jacket or raincoat, then I do a separate track for those persons. And, um, and uh, for example, if there's a scene where they are having ADR, it's really important to have this glow track. So now, quite often when we do feet properly and when we do props, props are all other sounds, not feet or this glow trussel. So it's, if the props are done, done really well, it's quite often that you don't need that much cloth, but uh, it's also for the international version really important to have. Uh, Maybe we should try out the, the, the running scene. Yeah. Yeah. Let's uh, now they start chasing each other and uh, and uh, let's try that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, with Foley or just with the with the with the Foley. I yeah. Think. Okay. Yeah. And so I try to stay with those guys when they are running on a... Okay. Ready? Okay, uh, normally I do so that I do all just running on grass, then maybe stop the recording, then we do the running on uh, concrete or gravel land, on dirt and uh, yeah. But uh, of course I we do the clothing for this normally and then we start doing props. And what kind of props are interesting because we just want to have the feeling of speed and the chasing and, uh, and uh, that, that there is really something happening and uh, let's go to place where they, they are going to push it. Uh, to where they push with the fence? Uh, just, just a little uh, later. With the push? Uh, yeah. 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 So uh, <laughs> let's try to use our grass as a push. So uh, these are props, it's uh, something else, not just uh, feet or cloth. And uh, then we, another, we do another prop, we do that when they are hitting the fence. Mm -hmm. I don't have the exact fence, but uh, we try this one. My suitcase was too small for this fence. Okay. <laughs> okay, but uh, you got the point. It wasn't exactly the right sounding fence, but uh, yeah. The but thing about this sequence was that we, we, uh, we, we really wanted to create this kind of action feeling of like when they are running after each other, creating this intensity. I mean, in, in, a, lot of, in a lot of kind of chase 
thrillers, especially now I'm like thinking of films like the Jason Bourne movies, like every time they're running, it's like <laughs> all the time. And we were thinking that for this film, we wanted to make this sequence a more emotional sequence. And because of that, we wanted to make, have the music be almost romantic. But then we still really needed the, 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 the pace and the tempo and the, this feeling of rhythm. Mm. So um, I asked Heike to kind of, could we take the sound of the clothes and somehow turn that into a rhythm? So you came up with an interesting idea for how to do that. Okay, yeah, we, actually there was one other project we did already. Uh, the Idealist, a little bit earlier, and uh, in that film we had an idea to make a, you mentioned that we do the clothing, which sounds like a helicopter. And uh, I think this idea is something that comes from there already. Yeah. So we, we made a kind of rhythmical. Peter had an idea that uh, Foley should be rhythmical, and I was listening the feet I already did, and as a natural feat, and then I was listening that sound. I think I was also listening to music. Yeah, exactly. You were yeah, listening and, to uh, the and score. The, and so I tried to do yeah. the, this sound. The so it's, it's kind of, it's, it's the feeling of music. It's just a little bit tricky because I need to follow some sync of feet, and then I was listening to the, yeah. the sync of music. But uh, this is the sound I did with this method. I was using, well, I, I tell you soon what I was using. <laughs> yes. contact microphone inside the leather glow. Yeah. So a contact microphone is a microphone that records, instead of recording the direct signal, it's recording mm. whatever is touching mm. upon it and yeah. the vibrations of the yeah. material. So you can get these kind of more yeah. like internalized sounds. Um, maybe we should just show that part of the clip, how yeah, it actually yeah. sounds in the film. One thing I need to say here is that, uh, for example, this was Scandinavian films and the Scandinavian films doesn't have the big budget like a big US films and, uh, and uh, so it's really, really important that you know which are the places you need something like these extra things. And uh, you need to really carefully spot those places. And, uh, and uh, that's how you can make good sound. Yeah. Let's hear how it sounds in the film. Yeah. Music is very like swelling and romantic and then the, the, the pulse of the music is actually Foley. So it's a really uh, interesting way of, of, uh, of making the Foley turn into music and also having the music almost like a sound effect. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's something we really love to do is to try and erase this, I mean, there's this weird kind of border often between music and sound where there's this thing about like the sound effects are over here and the music is over there but it's much more interesting if all of that comes together and we try to kind of really make those things melt together. Um, there was mention of Oli um, I think we should uh, look at that now. Uh, and start out with um, the version where we hear everything. Um, so a nice little, uh, mm. nice little quiet scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah quiet. Um, when you have a sequence like this, it's it's there's so many layers of sound. So there's of course the rain and. The, the, there's a dialogue and, and there's all this boxing and 
for all these elements of boxing, like there was really playing around with a lot of different layers to give this feeling like it's not just one hit, but something that we often work with when we collaborate is this idea that that a sound is not just one sound, a sound affects another sound and it affects another sound or in the in the sense that when when you when they hit each other in the ring then you hear the hit but it's also like movement of feet and it's movement of body and it's ch the chains of the boxing ring and all these elements. Um, maybe you should just uh, show a few yeah, of the elements. Uh, there. Um, the director Juho Kuosman and he, when we started talking about this project, he he he, he said that that uh, you know he wants this film sounds like a D. A. Benderbaker's documentary about Bob Dylan. Don't look back. And uh, okay, do we need any phone? <laughs> and uh, and uh, but uh, we started talking with Peter that, okay, let's update this Don't Look Back documentary into this, this year. And, uh, um, but the Juho was, uh, the director Juho, he's really concerned about this. Is, it's, uh, it's, uh, everything is like sounds really natural. So from the very beginning, we knew that boxing can't sound like Rocky movies. And uh, for example, with, uh, with those boxing rings, in that time, they were, they were uh, covered with cloth and, uh, and the Juho didn't want, for example, the feet sound like this. It needs to sound more like, uh, almost like scuffing. And um, um, then, the, the, like Peter mentioned, the physicality was really, really important part of those that uh, boxing and uh, we use, I used quite a lot of times to find, uh, find the right kind of approach for it. Of course, I had a boxing gloves and we did the right kind of hitting. I had this, uh, what do you call it? The one with the hanging on the roof. The, yeah, yeah. And I, I was hitting that one. So, so I did all this, this uh, basic boxing sound. Then I wanted to have a kind of feeling that there is inside the clothes, there is this metal horseshoe. It's also hard. So I just did a hard layer for each hit. And if you put some cloth, it's just, it's not that snappy. And, uh, um, and it's very, very wet scene. And uh, we were using quite a lot of time to we used wet and water for everything we did. But there was a, for this boxing, there was a wet layer like they are hitting. And you know, we did the hit already with feet and uh, uh, with um, different layers just hitting. We don't need hit from this one anymore. We just hit the feeling of that it's wet. And also there was just the sound sound where all the time water is dripping on the floor and, uh, and uh, so it, it was quite, quite a lot of work with this idea. But, uh, and and, uh, and uh, about the physicality, like Peter said, one thing is also that you have the feeling that I think what makes the, for example, boxing and the hitting powerful is that something happens after the actual hit. And uh, so, uh, I had a feeling of trying to make the change rattle around. And actually, there is no change in the picture. When I, was, I started watching it more carefully, there's no, but I had a kind of idea that in boxing, there is change. <laughs> and so, uh, so I did kind of, I used a little bit bigger chain, but uh, after every hit and according to the movement, the, the ring is rattling all the time a little bit. And uh, these are those many, many layers we did for this scene. Yeah, so when you're mixing, then you have, I mean, so, I mean, each hit is like five or six different layers, and then you have all the extra sounds for every hit. So it's like 
many, many tracks of Foley, uh, which, I mean, Heike is just like recording and recording and recording and recording. <laughs> and you're kind of opening <coughs> this, all these tracks and you're like, oh yes, now, now we're talking. Uh, so it's a lot of different textures. Uh, I think it's worth seeing this sequence with just the Foley. Okay, yep. yeah. Actually, it doesn't happen very often, but this time, because actually this was like quite big film also for my hometown, Kokkola. Juho Kuosman and the director is from Kokkola, and this main actor, Jarkko Lahti, is from Kokkola. And uh, so they had a training camp before shootings in Kokkola. And, uh, and uh, yeah, this was a special case, because Jarkko Lahti, main actor, he's been training uh, four or five years boxing before these shootings. So Juho Kuosmanen, he must took him for, for this main role because he's been training so long. And he lost four official matches also. So that was good reason to take him for the main role. But uh, I went to that training ca uh, camp and I, I was really close to Jarkko when he was just uh, rehearsing boxing by himself and I was recording with my small Zoom recording, recorder, uh, his boxing, and I just tried to, I, I didn't have any idea to use that sound anywhere. I, was, I just wanted to take the feeling, what is to boxing real. And, uh, and uh, uh, I think it, it helps quite a lot, helps with this movie quite a lot to find the right kind of way of doing this physicality out with, uh, with sound. Yeah. Let's do the apartment scene. I think there's time for that. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, because of the way that we collaborate, Heike and I, um, we're constantly, because like one project leads into the next project, and we I kind of get ideas from one project and say, okay, let's try something like that on the next one. So after we did Olimeki, we did this uh, Danish uh, action thriller called Darkland. And um, um, when I read the script for the first time on that film, um, it's about this doctor who uh, has a brother who is killed by the mob. He's, uh, the brother is a, a gangster. Um, and then uh, the doctor wants to, he, he wants revenge and um, and he gets further and further into my, I mean, it's almost like a kind of psychosis almost, like want to kill these gangsters. And it's a quite tough one, like uh, it's, uh, when I read the script I was like, okay, how do we, how do we get people to kind of like this character? I mean, when you watch a film you need to kind of, uh, you need to like the main character, you need to somehow be, be interested in the character. And I thought that the way to do this was making it very subjective, making the sound very subjective so that you really emotionally feel the feelings that he's in, but at the same time also making sure that the violence was rough so that it shouldn't be like a... Uh, Hollywood action movie, boom, 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 but much more like, uh, like actually what happened in Oli making this kind of realism around mm. like hitting each other and how harsh that is. So um, yeah, um, we played around with different things, but let's show this clip and then talk a bit about the yeah. the textures of the a quiet entrance. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but this idea of like really making things rough, uh, and we uh, um, we're really thinking about okay, how to make something very physical. So, in like sound is something that 
in a way, it goes through our, I mean, it goes through our ears where, where it's something that we're very subconsciously aware of, but really getting this physical aspect into sound, so uh, really having this body feeling. So I think you used, uh, again, uh, your, uh, your contact mic on... Secret weapon. Yeah. Yeah. Should we, should, should we try and do the, the, the fight with... Uh, I'm using both microphones. Okay. Okay, let's see the movie again. Yeah, so it's this idea of like almost being inside the body of our main character. So we just do another layer of the cloth or what? Mm? Should we try and do another layer of just the cloth or? Just the cloth? Yeah. Uh, um, well, yeah, of course. Just more like a natural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We can close this one. <laughs> yep. It is a surprise. I do both feet and close. <laughs> yes. you. So this is just for the, this moment, I'm doing several sounds together, but normally I separate everything. For example, clothes and feet, they react so different way, for example, reverb, and if they are together, it's impossible to separate them again. But uh, it's acting, yeah. We brought a documentary as well. Yeah, Distant Parking of Dogs. Yeah. Um, and this film, um, uh, it's, uh, I mean, we, we did so many films together with Heike as a, as a Foley artist and me as a sound designer. And then uh, I, I'm usually mixing or mixing with someone else. Or, um, and then on this film, we decided to mix together. So it was like really a, a, 
and a new kind of adventure. Uh, the thing about doing all these projects together is this feeling of just experimenting all the time, playing around all the time, and really like it's it's kind of a journey in a way. Like like it's it's an adventure where we're trying out new things all the time and trying to evolve and trying to experiment. And I I really love this whole um, idea of the failures. Um, Heike and me are both like part of the process very early, so we have the time to make accidents, and sometimes accidents feels like accidents, but sometimes accidents are really great in the sense that you invent things and come up with mm. ideas and try out things. And some of these sounds that we've been experimenting with started out as like crazy ideas and then now suddenly it's a it's it's a way of, of playing around with things. So we so for us it's been very natural to kind of keep on developing our collaboration and this film was very special in the way that uh, to us it was a very powerful film it's very emotional um, but really had a lot of opportunity for playing with sound uh, the distant barking of dogs is a um, Danish documentary but it's taking place in Ukraine in the in the war zone between Ukraine and Russia uh, and it's about a a boy and his grandmother who lives in that area and their life in that area. Um, and it's, uh, as, a, as a lot of documentaries, it's shot uh, in a quite simple way. The director was also the photographer. He had two microphones, one on the camera and one radio mic on the main character, and that was it. Uh, so that meant that when we were doing, had to do the sound, then, I mean, pretty much everything you heard was dialogue, and dialogue, w which was very rough, so we really needed to expand to get this feeling of uh, intimacy that the film has. So we really needed to, to make the world come alive. So we did that in, the very, in many different ways. There was, of course, all the work with um, background sounds, like we got hold of a recordist from the area who had done different recordings and recorded a lot of new stuff, so the background ambiences you hear are actually from the area. Um, uh, a friend of Heike uh, um, was able to go to a military base in Finland and record all the different um, war, uh, weapons that is used between the two uh, Ukrainian and, and Russian shoulders. So um, that was a lot of work and we were collecting all these sounds, but then to really create this intimacy uh, of being there with the characters, we really needed the Foley to create the closeness of it. Yeah, and uh, as a, one, of, one of the sound designers, I can't hide my, my background as a Foley artist and uh, so I used, we used a little bit those sound editing days that we did uh, sound effects like fully organic way. I mean the sounds, because uh, we had an idea that this small place, village is totally deserted, that there's nobody living anymore and everything is rattling. There's only a few old ladies with small kids and that, that's it. And, and uh, so everything is rattling and there was a lot of scenes I just was watching. I was just watching, watching the picture and uh, and uh, doing like, a, like. A <coughs> these kind of sounds and uh, and uh, and, uh, but it's a difference. Who has worked more with sound? It's really hard to find those, that kind of sounds from uh, libraries. So and and uh, when I when I when I'm watching the movie and doing these sounds, it's it's it totally fits fits the story and, uh, and uh, you know, even I don't see anything which is rattling in the picture, but I'm just feeling what they are feeling. So, 
so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we had a lot of sounds like that to really create this kind of the, the creaky sound of this. Um, well, this is not the best scene for that one, but, no, uh, no. but it, it, it's in the, But this scene is something we did already, maybe one year before we did the actual sound work. Yeah, yeah. It was during the editing process and uh, there was not much they edited anymore. I think because of the sound, it worked pretty well and... Yeah. And, uh, it's something that we do a lot is that we're part of the process very early, so... Uh, Heike is the first Foley artist I met that read the script, uh, which is actually a great help because that is where the story is formed in many ways. So to kind of be able to talk about the project from very early on is such an advantage. Uh, and uh, when you read the script, for me, then you it's almost like a shopping or like a grocery, grocery list, like, okay, I need cars from 1978, I need like, for this like, I need ambiences from this place, I need birds in the summer, I need birds mm. in the winter, I need uh, insects from the autumn, I need, I mean, you have all these, and we need uh, the sound of lambs, the, we need the sound, I mean, all these things, so, so um, we collect a lot of sounds, and we are able to start talking about these things very early, so, so, uh, yeah, Heike and Pietro Kohonen, who's, who's been uh, working a lot with Heike and with us, uh, it was the three of us doing this film together. And, um, and you did, you, you worked on this sequence from very early on. Mm. So it was a, and the good thing about working, collaborating early with sound is that you really integrate the sound as a storyteller. I mean, instead of, Sometimes if you want to do like an atmospheric sequence in the, when you picture editing, then if you don't have any sound, then often you just add a piece of music. But for this sequence we're gonna show you now, there is no music and it's all about the, the characters listening. Um, so it was super important with the sounds. Um, and um, uh, the, the title itself, The Distant Barking of Dogs, I mean, that's sounds. So, um, um, yeah, let's let's play the yeah. sequence and. So it's a quiet neighborhood. Yeah. Um, it's um, there's all these elements to this. Of course, there's um, there's these bombs, which was a big thing that we really needed to solve because when you heard the recordings um, it, there was almost none of the this this war happening so you could see how the Oleg the main character reacted to all these mm. things and Simon the director he was really really focused on getting all this right because he had been there for such a long time that just like the inhabitants of the city, he knew the sounds of this warfare. I mean, when you live in a war zone, then you really think with your ears a lot, and you get to learn, like, if the, there's a bomb sounding in, like, at a certain distance, then you don't need to be afraid. When the bomb is closer, then you need to be afraid. Yeah. And when the dogs start barking, then you need to be worried. Um, and then... We were also having, like, like Heike s said with this creaking thing, like when the bombs get really close, then you hear things rattling and creaking. Um, so in many ways, like, that was a big thing for the sound effects to build this up. And um, because Simon, the director, knew exactly how every bomb should sound, then on a sequence like this, we actually drew, like, a map of where the characters were placed and where every bomb shell was fired from so that and, uh, and so th there was a certain sound for the russians firing a grenade yeah, yeah. and for it landing on the ukrainian side and a certain sound for the ukrainian yeah. like firing off and when they got closer you could also hear the bombs yeah, passing I, in the air but officially they are not russians 
Yeah. But uh, uh, they were using different guns in Ukraine side and the troops on the east, eastern Ukraine side. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, but uh, and, and he has really, really well, well, uh, he was really thinking about the drama, what is happening, for example, in this scene with artillery sounds. And then, then the, I mean, then you need to have this core of a very like emotional presence of the characters. So a lot of that was built with Foley. So like, like all the steps and so on, we needed to do with Foley because there was almost none of that in the production. Uh, with this kind of film where the director has also made the cinematographing and the recording, we just, uh, just, uh, one shotgun on, on camera and, and uh, low mics and uh, uh, it's really, really rough and uh, there's a lot of places we just need to use that sound and we need to feed the foley also with that and sometimes it feels like I need to do the foley a little bit bad sounding in a way to fit with that production sound. And, uh, but then in this movie, actually just before this scene when the, this Oleg goes swimming, it's just the foley and, uh, and then there is with documentaries, I, th I think it's really fascinating, and there is, there is this challenge where you really need to fit the production track to kind of fill the gaps. For example, on the, on the fireplace, there is a lot of fire sounds and paper sounds on, on production, but there is not these small things when he is uh, cracking and, and cutting sticks. And uh, if we have those sounds, we are able to go a little bit closer to him, but just before there was seen when he goes swim, in the middle of the night and uh, and uh, and the ten that's really fascinating with documentaries you are really able to forget everything else and really go to really really close to the main character um, Florian how's time going okay it's good <laughs> um, because we we wanted to show a clip from like their everyday life um, and maybe it, that would be fun to hear with, uh, with uh, a, a bit of the foley, I think. So, um, trying to make this work. Yep. So um, this is a sequence that's much more like intimate, um, and this is one of the sequences where. You really, as when you do the foley for something like this, it really has to feel very natural. So I think we'll just start out by watching the f final mix, and then afterwards I'll just play the foley for you. Yeah. So it's. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's often the quiet sounds that create this intimacy, and it's these. When, when you really hear these quiet sounds, like all the small moving and shuffling at the table, it really creates this feeling of being close to the characters, and that's something that Foley is amazing at. Florian, I think it's time for you to, to, to interrupt join here. the party. Nice to join the party. You can also stay there if you <laughs> want, so, because you have your microphones. There. Okay. We have a bit of time for questions. Um, and uh, there's a microphone here. It's actually this funny one, which you can throw around. If you are not familiar with it, get used to it. It's very fun. I have a quick question, especially with regards to the last film we've just seen. So I think with fiction films, we are quite familiar with the fact that they are built up from the scratch, and that sound is also sound that comes from Coca-Cola, in a way. Um, but especially with a documentary film, I think the trust of the uh, audience is often that these sounds are the real sounds, so like that this is there. So how do you, probably with regards to the, the morality of <coughs> making sounds uh, that were probably built up from some military place in Finland and shift them to the Ukraine. So is there a limit at some point in documentaries where you say, okay, I cannot make the sound up, I have to use the sound, uh, or I have to live with the fact and the sounds that were produced on set? originally where the film is coming from? In many ways, the only real limit is that you can't really do ADR for the characters. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't get the characters into, the, into a studio and say their lines again 
uh, that's hard. But the rest of it, there's a lot of cheating going on. I'm, I'm sorry to say. Um, but the thing is that that for me, it's it's really about storytelling. What story do you want to tell, and how how what is? I mean, we want to create this intimate feeling, and to create that, we need these quiet sounds, and you you can't catch them on the set if you don't have a very good microphone, or you c couldn't probably even do it if you had a good microphone. So there's all these details and and. And, and in a way, I mean, for me, I feel that when you're, when you're doing a documentary, then as a director already, when you start shooting your story and point your camera in a certain direction, you've already made a decision of this is what I want to, this is the story I want to tell. So already there, it's a very subjective thing. So for me, I usually talk about um, uh, not, Realism, but emotional realism. It has to feel real. It has to feel like it's from the characters, like it feels real for the characters and it feels real for us as the audience. Um, but it might not be the real sounds. It's quite often not the real sounds. Um, so that's a, a, one of the really the things I love about how the documentaries has developed during the last 10, 15 years is that you work creatively with every aspect of filmmaking. So you, it's not just a journalistic approach where you, it's, where you only like record an interview and then there's not much else. It's really about creating an immersive experience and creating a, an, a, 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 a story that envelops you and the characters that embrace you. Yeah, and, uh, and, uh, but the moral, I think, uh, only limit is are we honest or dishonest? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I've been using this film as an example for uh, in uh, different workshops, and uh, there has been a few times questions about, uh, okay, you have recreated all this bombing stuff, but is there any really? And uh, there is a little bit on production, as we told earlier, and we can see that they are reacting. But, uh, but of course, it's also the same thing if we are thinking about this quiet scene. Is it really emotional scene or not? And uh, it's our job to kind of feel the movie and make it sound like it feels. Uh, but it's the same thing. Uh, is it good morale to go in their life and do a film about them? It, 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 they are editing film. They are doing decisions which should uh, picture they are using from one moment. And uh, and uh, I think remember one one of my friend many years ago said that. Are you doing Foley for documentaries? And, and because he was just thinking about it's real. Well, our job is to do it so that it feels real. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, yeah. I remember a, a colleague of mine saying at one point that the only difference between fiction films and documentaries is that in a fiction films, the in fiction films, the actors get paid. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Where's the microphone right now? Or where's the question? Here we go. That's nice. In the back of the room. So. Hi. Uh, um, I've got three questions, if that's possible. Um, the first one is, how much stuff do you have? Like, for all these noises you make, you must have so much different equipment. Have you got a massive studio full of tons of different stuff? Or do you go and get it for each job? Or have you got, like, a massive warehouse full of equipment, how does it work? You have a lot of gear, I, I get a lot of props. I'm not sure how much I heard, but uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a, something like 350 square meters, and there's quite big rooms with full of this kind of crap, and, uh, and uh, well, uh, it's, my, it's my choice to work like that. <laughs> And, uh, but uh, I am really bad with microphones and really bad with microphone models. If I hear that somebody is using like this Neumann KMR and that works, that's good. Because I really, I re uh, my approach is so that I try to do sound, sound as good as, and I really like that the signal is really kind of flat, that there is nothing happening between me and uh, that much. Uh, 
But yeah, uh, Heike has this, uh, his studio is actually a, a f like a factory, uh, an old factory in Kokkola. So it's like a whole part of the, I, I visited last year and like a whole building with like, I mean, the, the size of this room just with different props. Uh, there's lots of stuff. Yeah. And what, what is the weirdest thing you've used to create a sound or the most, or the most kind of unexpected object? Uh, this is uh, quite many people is asking this. Uh, I, um, well, sometimes if you're doing something for for something that has happened yet, for example, the ski that which was happening in future, there was one project I was I, I've been working lately. I try to do sound for deaf people who don't hear anything, and uh, I don't feel that they are very difficult, but they are nice kind of new new areas to look at and uh, um, but I think maybe the question many people is asking what is the most difficult sound I think the most difficult is always act right way with the characters and with the story and uh, that's always a challenge yeah sorry to hog hello sorry to hog the mic the last question I wanted to ask was like have you, do you know this term French Foley and um, like, do you, sh for example, the documentary you did, did you do that all in studio or do you sometimes foley outside or in rooms and stuff like that? Uh, I have only maybe twice go outside from studio. Maybe one reason is so that uh, I'm lucky that I, I have in my studio, I have one normal dry, kind of dry sta foley stage visits, which it's like a studio environment, but then I have two other rooms. One sounds like a, um, like a corridor of, let's say, school or living room, and then we have one really high room which sounds like a church or factory, and with different kind of using different several microphones same time and recording. It sounds like a location. But uh, actually, there, there was one other film, the model we did together a few years ago, which happened in Paris, and we spent one day. Actually, that film was one of those rare films that I went to Copenhagen because of the co-production issues and uh, I did the Foley there and we, we spent four days in a normal Foley studio and then we went for one day in an apartment middle of Copenhagen and did all the feet, interior feet for one location and some doors in that place. Yeah, we needed, we needed like, uh, it took place in Paris in these big, big apartments with like big wooden floors and I was like telling Heike that, no, we can't do this inside a studio. We need to really go out, find a place like this with these like massive wooden floors. And then we, we went out to this apartment in Copenhagen where, where, which had these amazing floors and Heike could do all these sounds. And I remember we, I came out there and we would set it up together with a recordist and so on. And then I left and then half an hour went by and then I got a call from the producer saying, um, I just got a complaint from the neighbor. He's, they're saying it sounds like an elephant is walking around up there. So, um, yeah, location Foley can be interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, it's also a budget issue. It takes more time to go outside. And, uh, thank, thank you very much. Okay, yeah. I think you can throw the microphone to the fellow in front of you. Hello, um, thanks, uh, first of all, for your presentation. That was really interesting. Um, I've got two questions, if I may. Um, the first is, at, what, at which point in the movie do you start to pan sounds? Like, do objects have to have a certain distance in the film that you start paying them? Or, like, how, how do you make those decisions? And the second would be, um, I just recently um, followed this thread on Twitter where people were complaining um, Watching movies at home becomes an issue nowadays because um, sound design um, can become so loud in comparison to dialogues, for instance. And it was a super long thread where everyone was like, yeah, I'm constantly using my remote control um, to switch the sound levels um, because, I don't know, I, I think because there's no money spent to make a proper stereo mix anymore. Is this an issue that has been addressed to you? Does it, is it something that has been discussed or that's, yeah. Um, first thing about panning, um, I, 
I really like to start panning immediately. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to use all the, the tools we have available from the very beginning. So uh, I pan sounds from the very beginning. Uh, and when we collaborate, we also often, I mean, for some scenes, we plan out things for Foley that happens in left, center, and right. There's like three speakers behind the screen. So to like have certain sounds that can give an extra depth and and uh, we are, so so we are also talking about panning sometimes and I do a lot of panning um, um, regarding the whole thing about home cinema I think right now we are in a l place where we are a little bit between in between uh, states like we started it's when there was a flat screen, uh, the flat screen was kind of coming in everywhere in every house. Like, I think every sound designer died a little bit uh, with these flat screens and, and speakers on the back of the TV, which were so thin and really sounding terrible. And, and now there's kind of like a slowly a development where people realize that if they want to understand what the actors are saying, maybe they need a speaker that can actually play the lines back. So uh, now people are investing in speakers and hopefully they'll be like slowly a, like an evolution where we get better speakers for like uh, normal home standard TVs. I think that's something that everyone would benefit from. Um, so at the same time, there's an interest from like Netflix and so on to really uh, um, have uh, have special sound for their series and for their movies. And recently, Roma was like an amazing mix in Dolby Atmos. Um, very special the way that it worked with panning and so on. But of course, like if you only experience that on a very small TV speaker, it might seem a little weird. Yeah, okay. Uh, so it's interesting how things are developing. I think I think things right now are developing towards something better, but we're definitely in kind of like an in-between place where still trying to find out how to make um, make uh, lines audible in the living room. Yeah, just to follow up, it was interesting to read because actually the people were complaining that um, they couldn't understand the dialogues anymore because they were too quiet and the sound effects were just too massive. So it's not only like listening on like a small speaker system from a TV, but having an extra sound source or so. But they said like the balance is totally out of control and they, like especially if you watch a movie at night, then you have to turn down like whatever science fiction bombs or whatever, you have to turn down the volume and then even people said they switch on the uh, subtitles to get what people are actually saying. So it seems there's a super imbalance um, because of sound systems, I don't know, or, yeah. Yeah, there's, a, I mean, there's, it's a very, it's a discussion that takes a lot of yeah, different yeah, aspects yeah, into it, but I mean, it's, uh, I, 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 as, I'm, as I just said, I think we're like, hopefully slowly developing towards something that works better for everyone. We, uh, I mean, there's, and there's, there's all, there'll, there'll always be movies which have a bad mix, but there's also plenty of films out there who, which sounds amazing when more and more directors, I feel, are really into playing around with sound. And there's a, a definitely, a, I mean, a, a, a feeling of like a lot of great sound work out there, but sometimes it's not presented in the best possible way. Okay. Throw the microphone. <coughs> Probably a bit from away from your corner <laughs> to that one. Hi, um, you mentioned Roma. I thought one of the things that was so amazing about that mix was that they, the dialogue wasn't all centered. You know, the dialogue was coming from all over the place, which felt really unusual. And I wonder just artistically what you think of that, of people pulling dialogue out of the center track and putting it around. Uh, I, I loved Roma. I thought it was amazing. And uh, I was very happy to see it in Atmos. 
in a in a big cinema. I think that worked really really well. But it was also very special. I mean, it's not something that I would say works for every film. Like every film has to kind of select its own sonic language in a way. And that's also what we're trying to develop for each movie, trying to say, okay, how do we how do we play around with things and how do we create a special identity for the sound in every film? I felt that Roma was really unique in many ways and really evocative and also a film that uh, trusted the audience with no score so there was so much room for like experiencing the emotions and like amazing sound amazing acting a uh, beautiful film okay give it a try somewhere to the middle is there a question here in the front otherwise just here we go then you're the next one no, oh, don't ruin it. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, I, was, I was wondering, uh, it's great that you get to start working on the sound uh, very early on in the process. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how, what kind of conversations you have with the director and the picture editor and how their intention influences your sound design and how what you do with the storytelling uh, influences their decisions? Um, I, th I think it's amazing to be part of the script process and talk with the director and also bring the composer in that early because then you really have a very close collaboration about like finding out how a movie should sound. Um, I think that sometimes you forget how much sound really means for every, like, every everyday uh, action. So, like, even like two people talking at a cafe, having a conversation. Okay, should they be? Is it a very noisy cafe? So they're talking very loud to each other, like that. Okay, I really want to leave you now. I don't love you anymore. Or is it more like a very quiet cafe? They're talking like, oh, I don't love you anymore. I need to leave you now. So for me, that is sound design already. Like you, you, you decide on okay, how should each scene sound, and that means a lot for how we how we experience the scene. So it's both about like like how to use sound in abstract ways and how to use sound like in inside the scenes, but it's also about just like the general like emotion and direction of actors and so on. Uh, I think there's. Uh, having those kind of talks very early uh, and I, I sometimes when I get a script I, 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 I ask to get it as a word document so that then sometimes I, I just uh, take away the dialogue uh, and then I read the script without the dialogue because sometimes there's so much focus on the words, the lines of dialogue and you t tend to forget what the actual emotions and what is actually happening in the script apart from the dialogue. Uh, and that can be very inspirational as well. So there's many ways of kind of having a communication about the film very early on. Yes, uh, actually I've been lucky with the project I've been working with Peter that there is a directors who are really in the sound and, uh, and, uh, and uh, for example, we were today at the workshop uh, showing a, clips from the Danish movie The Idealist by Christina Rosendale and Peter told that uh, when they got the Foley, Christina was just listening to the whole movie just with Foley. And, uh, and, uh, but also, of course, there's directors who never say anything. And uh, maybe they're wondering at the mixing stage that where is this steps coming now? And, and, uh, but uh, I have also learned that the bigger the project is, so the more, more are the directors also interested about sound. And because uh, uh, I have worked a few times with bigger pro US projects and, uh, and uh, somebody said before those films that, okay, now it's going to be so that nobody's going to be in touch with you, but it's totally opposite. They are really saying their wishes and what they want to hear and uh, they are also giving feedback and saying thank you, and, and, and that's really important. We are humans. 
So <clears throat> the microphone should go from there to there. <laughs> Probably in two steps. Oh. <laughs> oh, it's done. Oh. It works also without this part, so no worries. Uh -oh. Oh my God. Does it work? Yes. Um, yeah, thank you for your presentation. It was for me very enriching to see uh, how you did live and um, recording or doing live Foley sounds because um, as many sound designers and studios now use uh, a lot of like sound libraries nowadays and uh, especially in the last 10 years it's become easier and easier to have huge amounts of like data and of sound effects. I wonder um, how efficient it is still to use Foley sounds. Um, I mean, I've seen today that it can be really efficient because you can do it somehow live and get the sound that you really want. But I also wonder where are your limitations somehow because in the title of this panel there's also the word shot and I wonder sometimes how efficient it would be to record gunshots or very specialized sounds, uh, and yeah, how often you now also stick to these all these uh, recorded sounds? Yeah. Mm, well, uh, using libraries as a, instead of Foley, it's it's just uh, uh, I'm really direct with this, but it's just a piece of crap because it can never do the same, and it's not Foley. It's not Foley. I know there's libraries which call themselves Foley libraries, or there's techniques using samplers or something like that, that you sample different kind of steps and that then you play them, somebody's walking and you play them, but it's not Foley anymore because Foley is acting. It's acting with the story, it's acting with the character and uh, it's, it's about also that the Foley artist is feeling the story same time he's doing the sound and uh, that's what you can never do. You can come, maybe you can come a little bit close but you can't get good enough and uh, these are kind of things that um, I'm pretty sure that if you just play one track for normal people who are watching films, can you hear the difference? Somebody says, no, I can't hear the difference. But if you watch the whole movie, you can feel the difference. You can point on your, on your finger that, okay, these feet were real, they are now better ones. But I can, I'm pretty sure that you can feel the difference. And, uh, and um, one thing is also, it's faster to do it as a Foley. If you think about that you are doing with somewhere or using some uh, libraries and you try to cut the steps to the right place, it takes more time. For example, there's 10 steps. Have you edited them already? <laughs> That's how it goes. And, but it's, I, I think the main thing is, I think the main thing is not that how to use your time, but the main thing is the performance side. If you are using some other, other effects like creakings and you can use about, but it's not Foley anymore. That's the difference. Any final question? So probably there's a bit of time to chat with the two guys afterwards. Probably here, the last question, not too far away. Throw it. Uh, hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question to Heike. Um, thank you for your trip with the uh, ground coffee, first of all. And uh, I, I know full artists don't usually like sharing their secrets, but if you could, what is your approach to snow, and especially the wet snow around zero, and maybe snow with the crust? And also, <coughs> sorry. Uh, I worked uh, with uh, female Foley artists and they sometimes have problem with uh, male, huge male steps. Uh, do you have any problems with uh, women in high heels? And what is your approach and maybe tips again, they can sound clicky. Or... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Two very good questions. Yeah. Uh, for snow, it depends of course, as you said, how you use wet snow. I use like wet clothes sometimes and, uh, and uh, for really cold snow, just a cornstarch or a potato powder. And, uh, and uh, I also sometimes put, I have a sack of cornstarch. I might 
it depends so much what kind of snow they are like to hear. If it's really cold, then it might be so that just the potato powder is enough, but sometimes I mess it with the sand or gravel or even dirt to put together. And uh, it, it's always what you want to hear. If you can hear the sound you are looking for, then it's easier to make. I have also noticed that cornstarch corn doesn't make any sound after it gets wet. So I make quite often so that I do first uh, snow part and then do the wet as an add sound. Uh, and the uh, second question, I don't have any problems with female feet, <laughs> with high heels or whatever. And, uh, and uh, uh, I remember actually first time when I, 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 after I saw somebody else doing Foley was, uh, was Marco Costanzo in, uh, in New York. And, uh, and uh, he was saying that he was he's my size man and he was saying that uh, I can't do heavy, heavy enough feet. And, uh, and I said that do, you, need to, you need to eat more. And uh, he, Marco said that yes, but I was just in LA and there were small ladies who are walking so heavy. So uh, it, it's a technique. It's not eating issue, it's a technique. <laughs> and so uh, you just need to try. And sometimes it's also a question of uh, the pit. Might be that the, your pit is not good enough. Sorry, your what? The surface, the pit. Ah, surface. For, uh, quite often it's, it might be a problem with wood or uh, some other stuff. And, uh, and, uh, and you need to find the, the, the clacky feet, they are awful. <laughs> Like you, like you said, and, and, and yeah, you just need to. <laughs> thank you. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. At this point, so thank you also to Heike and Peter. I think um, I've never said this with more joy. It really sounded interesting. <laughs> thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, thank you also for being here with us today and tonight. Um, <clears throat> give a big applause to the both.